Hola queridas y queridos, mi nombre es Oscar Adame, soy editor de Warp y hoy vengo a presentarles una entrevista con el productor Richard Melville, mejor conocido como la superestrella Moby. Bajo el alias de Moby, Richard Melville ha producido un gran, una gran cantidad de discos, pero no fue sino hasta que lanzó en 1999 su trabajo discográfico Play, que logró prominencia y logró incrustarse en lo más profundo de la cultura popular internacional. Ese álbum fue muy interesante y hoy mismo se considera como un clásico debido a la forma en la cual combinó pues, elementos eh, clásicos, melodías de piano con electrónica eh, ambiental y cantos y sampleos de música gospel y de música soul. Hoy en día está trabajando, está a punto de estrenar un álbum en el que se llama Reprise, en el cual hace una hibridación entre lo que ya había realizado en los clásicos que produjo de música electrónica para transformarlos ahora a un formato clásico con orquestas involucradas, eh, con instrumentos eh, acústicos sobre todo e incluso eh, coros de música gospel. Eh, sobre este lanzamiento hablamos con él y también sobre el estreno de su nuevo documental Moby Doc un filme de tinte surrealista en el cual profundiza en su vida. Entonces, espero la disfruten. There's me. Yeah, there's you. I can see you now. Hi, how are you? Okay. Uh, good, thanks. I might have to move around because it's really hot outside. And so right here, uh, let me just figure out, because I'm on my, it's on a little, tiny phone. Well, that um, is beautiful also, with a lot of trees and green everywhere. Yeah, so. Okay. Let's see. How, is that okay? Yeah, that's pretty nice. Thank you very much. Well, okay, great. I saw your documentary yesterday and I was very impressed. I think it, it was so funny and it was I think it, it, it was very, very, uh, how do you say, sincere. Uh, I have always been having this feeling. I love groups. I love authors who maybe play a little bit with uh, a little bit of self-deprecating. I think that's very uh, honest in art. I think it's one of the most, uh, how do you say, like honest ways to, to sell things and to sell things about yourself because you are allowing yourself to maybe um, recognize the things that you don't like about yourself, that are fragile, that are a little bit ugly, but at the same time, you are like becoming a little bit stronger by figuring out uh, all these things that most people don't want to uh, recognize that are in them, right? And I think you are very good doing that. Well, thank you. I mean, to be honest with you, There's a part of me that wishes I didn't have as much cause to be self-deprecating. You know, like, um, for a lot of my life, especially, you know, like my life as a musician, like, I wanted to be cooler. I wanted to have hair. I wanted to be, you know, like, be sort of like a more attractive, sexy, esoteric musician. And part of, I think, growing up, part of that willingness to be honest is to look at what are traditionally seen as like the darker sides of the self. Mm -hmm. You know, like you think of like the Jungian shadow self, but sometimes the darker sides of our self, the parts that we don't want to look at, they aren't dark. They're just kind of embarrassing. You know, like, it's not like, when honestly looking at ourselves, the underside of ourselves is some like psychopathic serial killer. Usually the underside of ourselves is just kind of an awkward adolescent, you know? And, and then also some of the, the parts of ourselves that we don't want to be honest about are the parts that are common to every human being on the planet. You know, everybody battles insecurity. Everybody, 
thinks that they could be doing things better. Everybody, you know, like everybody gets older, everybody gets sick, everyone dies, everyone loses strength, everyone loses youth. But we don't want to address those things. You know, we want to pretend that that's not the case. And it's it's almost like once you accept or like almost like look at your willingness to be honest, it's so liberating. Like there's just a freedom that comes from that when you don't have to pretend to be something that you're not. Yeah, yeah, I understand that very much. Uh, I also think that everyone feels lonely, right? Yeah, I mean, that's it's that question of, and I apologize if I sound too esoteric, but, sure. or, or self-evident, but it's the human condition. You know, the human condition There can be great joy in the human condition. There can be great comfort in the human condition. But ultimately, there's so much confusion mm -hmm. and there's loneliness. And because we are alive for a couple of decades and then we die and no one knows what happens after we die. No one knows if our lives have meaning or importance or significance. And anyone who claims to know, I kind of question the truth of what they're saying that's right well one of the things that also i think i like very much about our, your documentary and the and the way that you are like self-deprecating a little bit is that you are not uh, like criticizing yourself for being yourself you're only criticizing your past self because you wanted to be uh, something else right uh, and i think that's one of the most important lessons on your film Yeah, I mean, as I was saying, like, sometimes it's very challenging to confront the, the most awkward and the least attractive things about ourselves. But then the irony is, you know, it's sort of like if you're going on a date, suppose you're getting to know someone, you're going on some dates, what's going to make you fall in love with them is not their perfection but their humanity you know it's going to be that person you know how they look in the morning you know when their hair's all over the place or when they do karaoke and it sounds terrible or you know when they cry in front of you for the first time like it's the human vulnerability the 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 imperfections that are the best ultimately kind of the best things about who we are but it's you know we live in a culture where very rarely people are encouraged to express those parts of themselves. I mean, look at social media, like social media, for the most part, it's people trying to present themselves as these perfect beings. And we're not, you know, and I know that's very self-evident, but it's just like to live in a culture where everybody else seems to know what they're doing and everybody else looks better and everybody else seems to be cooler and younger and sexier it can be really challenging sure but then you realize it's just not true i i wanted to to leave this question at the end because i think it's one of the most important questions but uh, it, it, it comes from from this that you are saying yeah you say in your documentary that for being happy and to feel fulfilled, you don't need to fulfill the expectations of people, right? You don't need to, uh, how do you say, to have like your carpet of successes carrying around because that doesn't make anyone happier. Um, what I want to know, <laughs> like if you have been thinking about what is really what make life important and what can make you happier, if it is not the carpet of success or things that you mm -hmm. have living to it's it's such a wonderful question and i feel like if i was to try and answer it for other people that would be very presumptuous of me but what i can say is it's almost a combination of learning to love and appreciate the very simple things that are right in front of you. You know, for example, I would say to someone like, if you can't be happy eating a perfect orange, you'll never be happy. You know, if you can't be happy 
listening to your favorite piece of music, you'll never be really happy. Like it's the world is filled with all these things that are capable of delivering so much happiness and we tend to ignore them while we focus on like the one or two things that we think we should be pursuing to make us happy. You know, like I, I used to give this example, um, like the idea of someone going into a room to meditate on happiness and shutting the door on their dog and sh shutting the door on nature and shutting the door on things that are actually beautiful and capable of creating happiness. There's this one quote, I think there's a Sufi poet called Kabir. He was similar to Rumi, like one of the, or like, you know, from I guess the 13th century. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but he had this great line, which is basically, um, he says, while, while we are, you know, praying while we are meditating while we are you know like cutting ourselves while we are you know like locking ourselves in temples god is outside lonely yeah. and again i'm not saying i know who or what god is but it's the idea that the things that will make us happy are usually right there you know and they're very simple um but with also the sadness that comes from the recognition that like everything is temporary, you know? And it's that, that inherently the paradox of humanity is recognizing like the world is filled with beauty and things that can bring us joy, but it's all going to die. <laughs> so it's the happiness from, from holding someone you love or holding an animal or looking at nature, but the recognition I'm going to die, you're going to die, everything's going to die, everything's impermanent, and the sadness that's always there with the happiness, but that's that's hum that's human existence. Yeah, I understand. One of the, well, there's a short story that I love very much that it's called Word Police, about a girl who was raised by words, right? And after she was like rescued in a way by human society, she uh, starts to develop human recognition, right? But the thing that made her not really being human at the end is that she was not like capable of knowing, uh, or, of recognize death and the end of existence. Uh, hmm. I think that's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> What's the name of the book? Wolf Alice, it's a short story. Okay, I'll, I'll read that after the interview. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's pretty, pretty short book. It's very interesting. And well, it, a, a lot of your documentary also deals with death, right? Even you talk to, to death in a couple of scenes. Um, and well, you say that uh, you admire his work because <laughs> it put <laughs> to the misery of animals and to the misery of other people. Uh, but I, I tend to think that it, it is much easier to accept death on, on other beings, right? I want to know, like, if you, um, if you, how do you say, if the scenes that you share with death, in them you are also saying that you accept your own death and you are prepared for it. Well, it's hard. Uh, sure. And it makes me think of, and I know that he's definitely not someone we should reference right now, but there's a Woody Allen quote where he said, you know, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Um, it's the idea that I can have all these ideas about death and I can have, you know, I can talk about death philosophically. I can talk about other people's death, but when it comes to my own, who knows? Like if someone said to me, oh, guess what? In one minute, you are going to explode and be dead. <laughs> when the truth of it when we're confronted with the truth of it i have no idea how i'll respond you know like i might suddenly start do what most people do is like start crying and like pleading with the universe to let me stay alive or i might just be curious and have acceptance but until i mean it's kind of like a strange analogy 
Have you ever gone swimming in very cold water? I uh, I have, yeah. So, when you're standing outside of the cold water, whether it's a lake, an ocean, a swimming pool, when you're looking at it, and you think how you're gonna feel, you're like, oh, it'll be fine. And then when you're in the middle of the cold water, your perspective is very, very different. And so I just, when I'm being when I'm finally confronted with death, I just, who knows what my perspective will be. Yeah, well, that's a very human and uh, profound response, if I must say something. But, but I will say, the, the one thing, it's, it's kind of the central absurdity of the human condition is our collective attitude towards death. Like either people thinking that somehow it won't affect them, sure. or thinking that somehow they can like you know build enough of a life so that death won't matter um and the truth is it's just so so absurd that we all ignore death when death is the only guarantee in our lives you know there's there's no guarantee that you and i will each take one more breath there's yeah. no guarantee that you and i will be alive in one second there's absolutely a guarantee that at some point you and i will be very dead and it's it's so interesting that collectively we all ignore the only truth yeah it's like it's easier for us to maybe forget uh, a long periods of periods of time about it yeah and it's also the fact that like you know when things die they tend to be terrifying you know they they rot they you know, like think of skeletons, think of corpses, think of rotting things like these are scary. And like the idea that someday we will be that it's it's not the happiest thought. Yeah, sure. But there's a beauty to it as well. The the sort of the cycle, you know, um, I mean, one of my favorite things to do, and I don't know if this has anything to do with the record or the movie, but nonetheless, um, I I do my own landscaping and one of my favorite things to do is when leaves fall from trees when you know when plants start to die I don't throw them away I return them back to the soil mm -hmm. and it gives you this sense that like in order you know in order for life to, grow. to exist it needs death like you can't nothing that's growing nothing that's alive can survive without death you know and once you become a little more connected to that cycle i think your feelings about death change and obviously like you know pe people who live in cities people who aren't connected to it don't ha might not have a glimmer of that awareness no but it is it is true well it is natural biologically true <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, so jumping to another subject, I was very surprised when I heard your own version of Porcelain on your documentary, right? Because you uh, attach it to, to your mother. And well, as long as I have uh, know uh, about this song, I know that it was about uh, some ex-girlfriend, right? But the lyrics that you put on this version seems to me uh, even more significant in a way and even more uh, how do you say like uh, like strong uh, it seems to me that maybe this was the the first um, how do you say version of it and that maybe it is a song recorded with your mother in mind um it's i mean it was written right after my mother died mm -hmm. you know there was this period in the late 90s when <coughs> excuse me no, no, don't. when i was you know my mother had just died i had lost my record deal i was battling alcoholism and drug addiction i was in the middle of a bad breakup like things were things were pretty bad and so the but obviously one of the most significant parts was the death of my mother you know and it's something that i think generally is very hard it's hard for for me to deal with which is looking at our parents you know looking because i don't know about you 
or anybody else, but like my relationship with my mother was very complicated. And there was, you know, appreciation, but so much sadness tied up in it as well. So you're absolutely right that the underlying emotion of the song might very much be a result of that period, you know, of, you know, that it's that just that expression of loss. Sure. Uh, and what about the new lyrics you wrote them to, to be on the documentary? Like this phrase of when I'm dreaming, I'm hearing yelling all the time and all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I, and I'm, I hope this isn't disappointing. I don't know if I thought about it that much. Okay, sure. Like some, sometimes it's, you know, there's just sort of spontaneous expression and I guess I'll have to like in therapy discuss it. Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, and you have been thinking a lot about your life these past years. You published uh, both uh, memorial books. Now you are making this documentary. I want to know uh, if you have think about uh, why do you think maybe that you have the necessity to to maybe um, recognize the things that you have been living through and analyze them. Because, well, it is not some something that Uh, every human does, right? It is very uh, focused to certain individuals. And I want to know, what are your motivation to do so? Well, I would say on one hand, the reason that I use my story as inspiration mm -hmm. is because it's the only story that I have, you know? And I am really appreciative of other people who tell their stories. And in a way, it almost doesn't matter what the story is. What matters is their willingness to share it honestly. You know, like, for example, when I got sober, I started going to AA meetings and I just loved hearing people's stories. You know, especially when someone was willing to be authentic, when someone was willing to be honest. And so, When I'm telling my story, when I'm using my story as material, one, it's the hope that maybe I'll be able to communicate something to other people sure. that might resonate with them, that might that they might find meaningful. But also, by telling my story, in, whether it's books, movies, what have you, interviews, is the thought that maybe I will gain more insight, that I'll gain more awareness i mean because i can also understand someone could look at me and think that i'm the biggest narcissist in the world you know that you know i've written two memoirs i've got a documentary about my life like it seems very self-involved sure but it's also as i said like i don't know who else i don't know if i was to tell anyone else's story i wouldn't know it as well and i probably wouldn't be able to be as authentic and honest Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, have you heard about David Foster Wallace, the, the writer? Well, yeah. this whole metamodernism uh, subject on, on literature is about recognize your own egotistical uh, way of why you are making a book, right? And make it feel ironic, but very self-involved. Uh, it, is, it is the last wave of, of way to, to to make narratives like being the center of your own story always because and that's... and yeah and i'm just so i'm so appreciative of other people who have done that you know like um one of my favorite books is the journals of john cheever uh -huh. he's one of my favorite uh u.s writers and his ability to sort of like describe himself because like On one hand, we don't know ourselves very well, but on the other hand, we know ourselves better than we know anything. Sure. And especially as regards an experience of the human condition, no one knows it better than you do. And no one knows it better than I do. No one knows it better than their own experience of the human condition. And especially the subtle parts of it. You know, if you think about it, like a lot of fiction like if we're right or even like historical fiction um, biographies people tend to be written about in fairly broad terms 
as opposed to, as you mentioned, like David Foster Wallace or other people who've written about themselves, Proust is the idea that you can write about yourself in a, with a level of honesty and detail that you would never have for another person. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I understand very much that. Well, I want to know, to talk a little bit about animals. Uh, I, I one of the things that uh, made me very happy to 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 see on your documentary was this uh, scene where you talk about the rats, the lab rats that you have as mascots when you were kids. I I also have rabbits that were on, on labs as, as mascots. And I I got a, a lot of impression about uh, being with, with this rabbit called Harry because he was hungry all the time. <laughs> I was like, uh, how do you say like, well, I, a child with, with a pet, I, I like it very much, but he was so angry. And even my, my sister, got like a phobia through rabbits, right? Because of him. And uh, in the last few years, I have been thinking that maybe she was not scared of the rabbit per se, because the rabbit is, is a pure life form, right? It, it's an animal. Um, but maybe the, the more angrier and, how do you say, and uh, stupid things that we as human imprint, print, on, on, on this rabbit. I want to know, like, do you think that the impression that you have on your rat, on your lab rats, um, makes you maybe feel a little similar to me and my rabbit? And maybe um, if it has like a correlation, um, the things that you saw with your, rat, with your rats to being now an, an animal activist? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the big epiphany that I had happened in 1984 when I was 19, when I was 19 years old. And I had a rescue cat named Tucker. Sure. And I loved Tucker so much and I was petting Tucker. And all of a sudden, in one moment, I realized, oh, let me look at this with some ob objectivity. I was like, well, Tucker has two eyes and a central nervous system and a desire to avoid pain and suffering and a desire to live his life. Mm -hmm. And in that instant, I realized that was true for every animal, no matter whether they had fur or feathers or scales, every animal simply wanted to live its own life and avoid pain and suffering. And that was the moment I became a vegetarian. And then in 1987, I became a vegan. Sure. With the, uh, just the simple idea that every being, human and otherwise, just is entitled to its life. It's the only thing that an individual has, which is why when you put someone in prison or put someone in a cage, it's the worst thing you can do to them because you're depriving them of their life. And I simply just realized like all of Western ethics, all of human ethics are about respecting an individual you know and I just simply expanded that to all individuals yeah. um, and then I realized some individuals like with humans same thing with animals some are easier to love you know some like are these wonderful emotional giving gentle beings and some are assholes like there are animals who are just annoying but nonetheless, they still deserve their life. Yeah. You know? So it sounds like your rabbit might not have been such a cuddly, warm, loving animal, but nonetheless, he, Harry deserved to live his life free from you know, torture, from pain, from murder. Um, so that's, I mean, I'm, I'm an animal rights activist for so many reasons, you know, regarding workers' rights, climate, uh, human health, rainforest but ultimately it's that simple belief that every being is entitled to its own life i just have like two more questions and one is about this right uh, you said on your documentary that you were pretty sick about like need to looking for success that comes from human world uh, artificial world and then you say that you felt much more happier when being on, on nature 
right? And you start to to be this uh, glorious, uh, how do you say, like animal activist, and you start to to make these things that I think make you happier. Uh, I want to know, like, do you have maybe think about that? And maybe all this focus on nature and animals are like a medicine for you after human culture made you kind of sick? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's <laughs> one of my biggest challenges is trying to find the love for humans that I have for animals. Like one of, you know, like one of, like I can, if I go hiking, if I go out into the mountains, or into forests, I can be so in love with nature. Mm. It's trying to find the ability to feel that way about humanity. You know, because obviously some parts of humanity are wonderful. You know, the parts of humanity that, you know, the forgiveness and humility and kindness. But as we look at humanity, we see, you know, like the anger, the bigotry, The, you know, the racism, the misogyny, the homophobia, the genocide, the war, the environmental destruction. It, it's, it's really hard to love humanity, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I just like, that it's such a chat. Like I have to remind myself that like, you know, the same universe that created a puppy, the same universe that created a tree, also created humans and i have to try and work really hard to find love for those humans it's it's not that anyone cares i mean like whether i love humans or not doesn't matter to humanity but it's definitely a challenge i understand well just i i'm running out of time but i want to know well your next album is uh, like a compilation of songs made into classical form right i have loved all the 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 teasers that I have here. But I want to know a little bit about uh, what do you think uh, is important about these new versions? What what do you find in them that are, uh, how do you say, like worth a listen? Well, the only thing that really inspired me to want to make this record is the same thing that inspired me to want to make any piece of music is the simple ability or the simple desire to create emotion. Sure. You know, like I love the ability that acoustic instruments and orchestral elements have to communicate emotion. I also love the ability that electronic instruments have, but ultimately music is this baffling, confusing, magical art form where by moving air molecules, we can make people cry, we can make people laugh, we can make people dance, we can, you know, affect people emotionally. And so really, the form, I mean, it's almost like hearkening back to like Mies van der Rohe, the idea of form versus function. Sure. And the form can be interesting. You know, in this case, like an orchestra, a string quartet, gospel choir, like I think that's interesting, but ultimately everything has to serve the function. And the function is simply communicating emotion. That's great. And I'm sure you're, you're have a lot of success on that. And this album is going to be a success because of it. Well, the only success for me regarding music is, does the music have that ability to communicate emotion? Like there, I don't like the world of like quantifiable commercial metrics to determine success. Luckily, I simply don't pay attention to that. Like, I don't, I don't read reviews and I don't look at album sales. The only way I assess music is simply how does it communicate emotion? Sure. Yeah. And I'm pretty happy. I, I want, I need to tell you that I think Why Does My Heart Feel So Bad is one of the best songs ever. I love that. Oh, song. thank you. I'm pretty appreciative of, of all the things that I have living through listening to that song. And well, it, it was well, thank nice you. to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, it was really nice speaking with you. Um, and good luck with the remainder of the apocalypse. Oh, thank and you. Uh, yeah, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. The same to you. Bye bye. Okay, bye.